at the Mountains of Madness. I'm forced into speech because men of science have refused to follow my advice without knowing why. It is altogether against my will that I tell my reasons for opposing this contemplated invasion of the Antarctic, with its vast fossil hunt and its wholesale boring and melting of the ancient ice caps. And I am the more reluctant because my warning may be in vain. God, if I could read that fast the whole time, I would get this done so quick. Doubt of the real facts, I must, as I must reveal them, it is inevitable. Yet, if I suppressed what will seem extravagant and incredible, there would be nothing left. The hitherto withheld photographs, both ordinary and aerial, will count in my favor, for they are damnably vivid and graphic. Still, they will be doubted because of the great lengths to which clever fakery can be carried. The ink drawings, of course, will be jeered at as obvious impostures, notwithstanding the a strangeness of technique, which art experts ought to remark and puzzle over. In the end, I must rely on the judgment and standing of the few scientific leaders who have, on the one hand, sufficient independence of thought to weigh my data on its own hideously convincing merits, or in the light of certain primordial and highly baffling myth circles, and on the other hand, sufficient influence to deter the exploring world in general from any rash and overambitious program in the region of those mountains of madness. They said the name, Mountains of Madness, we're done. We did it. It is an unfortunate fact that relatively obscure men like myself and my associates, connected only with a small university, have little chance of making an impression where matters of wildly bizarre, highly controversial nature are concerned. It is further against us that we are not, in the strictest sense, specialists in the fields which came primarily to be concerned. As a geologist, my object leading in the Miskatronic University expedition was wholly that of securing deep-level specimens of rock and soil from various parts of the Antarctic continent. Aided by the remarkable drill devised by Professor Frank H. Pabodi of our engineering department. Good job, Pabodi. I had no wish to be a pioneer in any other field than this, but I did hope that the use of this new mechanical appliance at different points along previously explored paths would bring to light materials of a sort hitherto unreached by ordinary methods of collection. Pabodi's drilling apparatus, as the public already knows from our reports, was unique and radical in its lightness, portability, and capacity to combine the ordinary artisan drill principle with the principle of a small circular rock drill in such a way as to cope quickly with strata of varying hardness. Steel head, jointed rods, gasoline motor, collapsible wooden derrick, dynamiting paraphernalia, cording, rubbish removal auger, and sectional piping for boring five inches wide and up to 1,000 feet deep. Oh, that's pretty deep. All formed, with accessories needed, no greater load than three seven-dog sledges could carry. That still seems pretty heavy to me, actually. This would be made possible by the clever uh, aluminium alloy. There you go, Zunder. Of which most of the metal objects were fashioned. Four large Dornier aeroplanes, designed especially for the tremendous altitude flying necessary over the Antarctic Plateau, and with added fuel warming and quick starting devices worked out by Pabodi, could transport our entire expedition from a base at the edge of the Great Ice Barrier to various suitable inland points, and from these points, a sufficient quota of dogs would serve us. We plan to cover as great an area as one Antarctic season, or longer if necessary, would permit operating mostly in the mountain ranges on, and on the plateau of the Ross Sea, regions exploring in various degree by Shackleton, Amundsen, Scott, and Bird. With frequent changes of camp made by aeroplane and involving distances great enough to be of geological significance, we expected to unearth a quite unprecedented amount of material, especially in the Precambrian strata of which so narrow a range of Antarctic specimens had previously been secured. We wished also to obtain as great as possible a variety of the upper fossiliferous, fossiliferous rocks, sorry, words, since the primal life history of this bleak realm of ice and death is of the highest importance to our knowledge of the Earth's past. That the Antarctic continent was once temperate, and even tropical, with a teeming vegetable and animal life for which the lichens marine fauna, arachnidae, and penguins, of course, penguins, of the northern edge are the only survivals is a matter of common information, and we hope to expand that information in variety, accuracy, and detail. When a simple boring revealed fossiliferous signs, we would enlarge the aperture by blasting in order to get specimens of suitable size and condition. Our borings 
of varying depth and according to promise held out by the upper soil or rock, were to be confined to exposed or nearly exposed land surfaces. These inevitably being slopes and ridges because of the mile or two thickness of solid ice overlying the lower levels. We could not afford to waste drilling the depth of any considerable amount with mere glaciation, though Pabodi had worked out a plan for sinking copper electrodes in thick clusters of borings and melting off limited areas of ice which current from a gasoline-driven dy dynamo. It is this plan, which we could not even put into effect except experimentally on an expedition such as ours, that the coming Starkweather Moore expedition proposed to follow, despite the warnings. Uh, the warnings I have issued since our return from the Antarctic. The public knows of the Miskatronic expedition through our frequent wireless reports to the Arkham Advisor and Associated Press. The Arkham Advisor has shown up in like every single one of his stories so far. And through the later articles of Pabodi and myself, we consisted of four men from the university, Pabodi, Lake of the Biology Department, Artwood of the S Physics Department, also a meteorologist, and myself representing geology and having a nominal command Besides 16 assistants, oh, boasting there, seven graduate students from Miskatronic and nine skilled mechanics. Of these 16, 12 were qualified aeroplane pilots, but two of whom were competent wireless um, operators, or all but two were competent wireless operators. Eight of them understood navigation with a compass and sextant, <laughs> as did Pabodi, at, or, yeah, Atwood and I. In addition, of course, our ships... Two wooden ex-whalers reinforced for ice conditions and having auxiliary steam were fully manned. The Nathaniel Derby Pickman Foundation, aided by a few special contributions, financed the expedition. Hence, our preparations were extremely thorough, despite the absence of great publicity. The dogs, sledges, machines, camp materials, and unassembled parts of our five planes were delivered in Boston. And there our ships were loaded. We were marvelously well-equipped for our specific purposes, and in all matters pertaining to supplies, regimen, transportation, and camp construction, we profited by the excellent example of our many recent and exceptionally brilliant predecessors. It was the unusual number and fame of these predecessors which made our own expedition, ample though it was, so little noticed by the world at large. As the newspapers told, we sailed from Boston Harbor on September 2nd, 1930, taking a leisurely course down the coast through the Panama Canal, stopping at Samoa and Hobart, Tasmania, at which latter place we took our final supplies. None of our exploring party had ever been in the polar regions before. Hence, we all relied greatly on our ship captains, J.B. Douglas, commanding the brig Arkham, and serving as commander of the sea party, and George Thorfinson, commanding the bark Miskatronic, both veteran whalers in Antarctic waters. Stories with whalers tend to end up badly. A lot of the times. As we left the inhabited world behind, the, s the sun sank lower and lower the in the north and stayed longer and longer above the horizon each day. At about 62 degrees south latitude, we sighted our first icebergs, table-like objects with vertical sides, just before reaching the Antarctic Circle, which we crossed on October 20th with approximately uh, appropriately quaint ceremonies, and we were considerably troubled with field ice. The falling temperatures bothered me considerably after our long voyage through the tropics, but I tried to brace up for the worst rigors to come. On many occasions, the curious atmospheric effects enchanted me vastly. These included strikingly vivid mir mirage, the first I'd ever seen, in which distant bergs became the battlements of unimaginable cosmic castles. Pushing through the ice, which was fortunately either extens neither extensive nor thickly packed, we regained open water at south latitude 67 degrees, east longitude 175 degrees. On the morning of October 26th, a strong land blink appeared on the south, and before noon we all felt a thrill of excitement at beholding a vast, lofty, and snow-clad mountain chain which opened out and covered the whole vista ahead. At last we had encountered an outpost of great unknown continent and its cryptic world of frozen death. That sounds great. These peaks were obviously the Admiralty Range, discovered by Ross, and it would now be our task to round Cape Adair and sail down the east coast of Victoria Land to our contemplated base on the shore of McMurdo Sound, at the foot of the volcano Erebus in south latitude 77 degrees. I hope you guys can remember, like, 
all of these names, but because I cannot. This is far too many names. The last tap of the voyage was vivid and fancy stirring. Great barren peaks of mystery loomed up constantly against the west as the low northern sun of noon or the still lower horizon grazing southern sun of midnight poured its hazy reddish rays over the white snow. Bluish ice and water lanes and black bits of exposed granite slope. Through the desolate summit swept raging intermittent gusts of the terrible Antarctic wind, whose cadence sometimes held vague suggestions of a wild and half-sentient musical piping, with notes extending over a wide range and which for some subconscious mnemonic reason seemed to me disquieting and evilly, even dimly terrible. Something about the scene reminded me of the strange and disturbing Asian paintings of Nicholas Ro Oh, Rorsch. I think that's Rorsch. Could be wrong. Um, and of the still stranger and more disturbing descriptions of the evilly fabled plateau of Lang, which occur at the dreaded Necronomicon of the mad heir of Ab <laughs> Abdul Alharet. Uh, Al Hazret, I'm sorry, I just have to laugh because literally like every story, I think, except for the first one I read, has this in it, so. <sighs> he really, he just really loves talking about it. I was rather sorry later on that I ever looked into that monstrous book at the college library. Well, nobody should look in that apparently. On the 7th of November, sight of the westward range having been temporarily lost, we passed the Franklin Island and the next day just described the cones of Mount Erebus and the terror on Ross Island ahead, with the long line of Perry Mountains beyond. There now stretched off to the east the low white line of the Great Ice Barrier, rising perpendicularly to a height of 200 feet, like the rocky cliffs of Quebec, and marking the end of southward navigation. In the afternoon we entered McMurdo Sound and stood off the coast in the lee of smoking Mount Erebus. The Scoriac Peak towered up some 12,700 feet against the eastern sky like a Japanese print of the sacred Fujiyama, while beyond it rose the white, ghost-like height of Mount Terror, 10,900 feet in altitude, and now extinct as a volcano. Puffs of smoke from Erebus came intermittently, and one of the graduate assistants, a brilliant young fellow named Danforth, pointed out what looked like lava on the snowy slope remarking that this mountain, discovered in 1840, had undoubtedly been the source of Poe's image when he wrote seven years later, the lavas that restlessly roll their sulfurous currents down Yanek, the ultimate climbs of the pole that groan as they roll down Mount Yanek and the realms of the boreal pole. Danforth was a great reader of bizarre material and talked a good deal of Poe. I was interested in myself because of the Antarctic scene of Poe's only long story, the disturbing and enigmatical Arthur Gordon Pym. On the barren shore, on the lofty ice barrier in the background, myriads of grotesque penguins squawked and flapped their fins, while many fat seals were visible on the water, swimming or sprawling across large cakes of slowly drifting ice. Using small boats, we effected a difficult landing on Ross Island shortly after midnight on the morning of the 9th, carrying a line of cable from each of our ships and preparing to unload supplies by means of a breeches buoy equip uh, arrangement. Our sensations of, on the for, first tread on Antarctic, Antarctic soil were poignant and complex, even though at this particular point, the Scott and Shackleton expeditions had preceded us. Our camp on the frozen shore below the volcano slope was only a provisional one, headquarters being kept aboard the Arkham. We landed all our drilling apparatus, dogs, sledges, tents, provisions, gasoline tanks, experimental ice melting outfit, cameras, both ordinary and aerial, aeroplane parts, and other accessories, including three small portable wireless outfits, beside those in the planes, uh, besides those in the planes, capable of communicating with Arkham's large outfit from any part of the Antarctic continent that we would likely to visit. The ship's outfit, communicating with the outside world, was to convey press reports to the Arkham Advisor's powerful wireless station on Kingsport Head, Massachusetts. We hoped to complete our work during a single Antarctic summer, but if this proved impossible, we would winter on the Arkham, sending the Miskatronic north before the freezing of our ice for another summer's supplies. I need not repeat what the newspapers had already published about our early work, 
of our ascent of Mount Erebus, of our successful mineral borings at several points on Ross Island, and the singular speed with which Pabodi's apparatus had accomplished, even then, even through solid la rock layers, our provisional test of the small ice melting equipment, our perilous ascent of the Great Barrier with sledges and supplies, and our final assembling of five huge aeroplanes at the camp atop the barrier. The health of our land party, 20 men and 55 Alaskan sledge dogs, was remarkable, though of course we had so far encountered no really destructive temperatures or windstorms. For the most part, the thermometer varied between 0 and 20 to 25 degrees above, and our experience with New England winters had accustomed us to rigors of this sort. The barrier camp was semi-permanent and destined to be a storage cache for gasoline, provisions, dynamite, and other supplies. Only four of our planes we needed to carry we needed to carry the actual actual exploring material, the fifth being left with a pilot and two men from the ships at the storage cache to form a means of reaching us from the Arkham in case all our exploring planes were lost. Later, when not using all other planes for moving apparatus, we would employ one or two in shuttle transportation between this cache and another permanent base on the Great Plateau from six hundred to seven hundred miles southward, beyond Beardmore Glacier. Despite the almost unanimous accounts of appalling winds and tempests that pour down from the plateau, we determined to dispense with um, intermediate bases, taking our chances in the interest of economy and probable e efficiency. Wires reports have spoken of breathtaking, taking four-hour, non-stop flight of our squadron on November 21st over the lofty shelf ice, with vast peaks rising on the west and the unfathomed silences echoing on the sounds of our engines. Wind troubled us only moderately, and our radio compasses helped us through one opaque fog we encountered. When the vast rise loomed ahead, between latitudes 83 degrees and 84 degrees, we knew we had reached Beardmore Glacier, the largest glacier in the world, and that the frozen sea was now giving place to a frowning and mountainous coastline. At last we were truly entering the white aeon-dead world of the ultimate south. Even as we realized it, we saw the peak of Mount Nansen and in the eastern distance, towering up to its height of almost 15,000 feet. The su successful establishment of the southern base above the glacier in latitude 86 degrees, east longitude 174 degrees, and the phenomenally rapid and effective borings and blastings made at various points reached by our sledge trips and short aeroplane flights are matters of history as is the arduous and triumphant ascent of Mount Nansen by Pabodi and two of the graduate students, Gedney and Carroll, on December 13th through 15th. We were some 8,500 feet above sea level when the experimental drillings revealed solid ground only 12 feet down through snow and ice at certain points. We made considerable use of the small melting apparatus and sunk bores and performed dynamiting at many places where no previous explorer had ever thought of securing mineral specimens. The Precambrian granites and Beacon sandstones thus obtained confirmed our beliefs that this plateau was homogeneous, with great bulk of the continent of the west, but somewhat different from the parts lying eastward below South America, which we then thought to form a separate and smaller continent divided from the larger one by a frozen junction of Ross and Weddell seas, though Byrd had since disproved that hypothesis. In certain of the sandstones, dynamited and chiseled after boring revealed their nature, we found some highly interesting fossil markings and fragments, notably ferns, seaweed, trilobites, crinoids, and such mollusks as lingulae and gastropods, all of which seemed of real significance in connection with the region's primordial history. There was also a queer triangular striated marking, about a foot in greatest diameter, which Lake pieced together from three fragments of slate brought up from a deep blasted aperture. These fragments came from a point to the westward, near the Queen Alexandra range and the lakes, as a biologist seemed find, to find their curious markings unusually puzzling and provocative. Ooh. Though to my geological eye, it looked not unlike some of the ripple effects reasonably common in the sedimentary rocks. Since slate is no more than a metamorphic formation into which a sedimentary stratum is pressed, and since the pressure itself produces odd, distorting effects on any markings which may exist, I saw no reason for extreme wonder over the striated depression. On January 6, 1931, 
Lake, Pabodi, Daniels, all six of the students, four mechanics and myself, flew directly over the South Pole in two of the Great Plains, being forced down by a sudden high wind, which, fortunately, did not develop into a typical storm. This was, as the papers have stated, one of several observation flights, during others of which we tried to discern new topographical features in areas unreached by previous explorers. Our early flights were disappointing in this latter respect, though they afforded us some magnificent examples of the richly fantastic and deceptive mirages of the polar regions, of which our sea voyage had given us some brief foretastes. Distant mountains floated in the sky as enchanted cities, and often the whole white world would dissolve into a gold, silver, and scarlet land of Dunsanian dreams and adventurous expectancy under the magic of the low midnight sun. On cloudy days, we had considerable trouble flying in flying owing to the tendency of the snowy earth and sky to merge into one mystical opalescent void which no, with no visible horizon to mark the junction of the two. At length, we resolved to carry out our original plan of flying 500 miles eastward with all four exploring planes and establishing a fresh sub-base at a point which would probably be on the smaller continental division, as we mistakenly conceived it. Geological specimens obtained there would be desirable for purposes of comparison. Our health so far had remained excellent. Lime juice was offsetting the steady diet of tinned and salted food, and temperatures generally above zero enabling us to do without our thickest furs. It was now midsummer, and with haste and care we might have been able to conclude work by March and avoid a tedious wintering through the long Antarctic night. Several savage windstorms had burst upon us from the west, but we had escaped damage through the skill of Atwood in devising rudimentary aeroplane shelters and windbreaks of heavy snow blocks, reinforcing the principal camp buildings with snow. Our good luck and efficiency has indeed been almost uncanny. The outside world we knew, of course, of our uh, the outside world knew, of course, of our program, and was told also of Lake's strange and dogged insistence on a westward, or rather northwestward, prospecting trip before our radical shift to a new base. It seems he had pondered a great deal with and with alarmingly radical daring that over that triangular straight uh, straighted marking in the slate, reading into it certain contradictions in nature and geological period which whetted his curiosity to the utmost and made him avid to sink more borings and blastings in the west stretched formation to which the exhumed fragments evidently belonged. He was strangely convinced that the markings. Uh, that the marking was the print of some bulky, unknown, and radically unclassifiable organism of considerable advanced evolution, notwithstanding that the rock which bore it was so vastly ancient a date, Cambrian if not actually pre-Cambrian, as to preclude the probable existence not only of that all that evolved life, but of any life at all above the unicellular or at most the trilobite stage. These fragments, with their odd markings, must have been 500 million to 1,000 million years old. Popular imagination, I judge, responded actively to our wireless bulletins of Lake's start northwestward into regions never trodden by human foot or penetrated by human imagination, though we did not mention his wild hopes of revolutionizing the entire sciences of bio biology and geology. His preliminary sledging and boring journey of January 11th to 18th Boring as in drilling, not like nothing happened, although it could be both. Had brought up more and more of the Archaean slate, and even I was interested by the singular profusion of evident fossil markings in that unbelievably ancient stratum. These markings, however, were of very primitive life forms involving no great paradox, except that any life form should occur in rock as definitely Precambrian, as this seemed to be. Hence, I still failed to, failed to see the good sense of Lake's demand for an interlude in our time-saving program. An interlude requiring the use of all four planes, many men, and the whole of the expedition's mechanical apparatus. I did not, in the end, veto the plan, though I decided not to accompany the Northwestward Party, despite Lake's plea for my geological advice. While they were gone, I would remain at the base with Pabodi and five men and work out final plans for the eastward shift. In preparation for this transfer, one of the planes had begun to move up a good gasoline supply from McMurdo Sound, but this could wait temporarily. I kept with me one sledge and nine dogs, since it is unwise to be at any time without possible transportation, 
in an utterly tenantless world of aeon-long death. Lake's sub-expedition into the unknown, as everyone will recall, sent out its own reports from the shortwave transmitters on the planes, these being simultaneously picked up by our apparatus at the southern base and by the Arkham at McMurdo Sound, whence they were relayed to the outside world on wavelengths up to 50 meters. The start was made on January 22nd at 4 a.m., and the first wireless message we received came only two hours later, when Lake spoke of descending and starting a small-scale ice melting in Boar at a point some 300 miles away from us. Six hours after that second one, a very... A, a second and very excited message told of the frantic, beaver-like work whereby a shallow shaft had been sunk and blasted, culminating in the discovery of slate fragments with several markings approximately like the one which had caused the original puzzlement. Three hours later, a brief bulletin announced the resumption of the flight in the teeth of a raw and piercing gale, and when I dispatched a message of protest against further hazards, Lake replied curtly that his new specimens made any hazard worth taking. I saw that his excitement had reached a point of mutiny and that I could do nothing to check his headlong risk of the whole expedition's success. But it was appalling to think of his plunging deeper and deeper into that treacherous and sinister white immensity, immensity of tempest and unfathomed mysteries while stretched off for some 1,500 miles to the half-known, half-suspected coastline of Queen Mary and Knoxlands. Then, in about an hour and a half more, came the doubly excited message from Lake's moving plane, which almost reversed my sentiments and made me wish I had accompanied the party. 10.05 p.m. On the wing, after snowstorm, have spied mountain range ahead higher than any hitherto seen. May equal Himalayas, allowing for more height of plateau. Probable latitude 76 degrees, longitude 113 degrees. East reaches as far... East reaches as far can see to the right and left. Suspicion of two smoking cones. All peaks black and bare of snow. Gale blowing them off impedes navigation. After Pabodi, the men and I hung breathlessly over the receiver. Thought of this titanic mountain rampart several hundred miles away from our inflamed, or, away inflamed our deepest sense of adventure, and we rejoiced that our expedition, if not ourselves personally, had been its discoveries. And half an hour late called us again. Molten's plane forced down on plateau and foothills, but nobody hurt, and perhaps can repair. Shall transfer essentials to other three for return, or further moves if necessary. But no more heavy plane travel needed just now. Mountains surpass anything in our imagination. Am going up scouting in Carol's place, with all weight out. You can't imagine anything like this. Highest peaks must go over 35,000 feet. Everest out of the running. Our Atwood to work out height with Theoda with uh, Theodolite, while Carol and I go up. Probably wrong about cones, for formations look stratified, possibly pre-Cambrian slate with other strata mixed in. Queer skyline effects, regular sections of cubes clinging to highest peaks. Whole thing marvelous and red-gold light of low sun, like land of mystery in a dream or gateway to forbidden world of untrodden wonders. Wish you were here to study. Wow, make him feel bad for not showing up. Though it was technically sleeping time, not one of us listeners thought for a moment of retiring. It must have been a good deal the same at McMurdo Sound, where the supply cache and the Arkham were also getting the messages, for Captain Douglas gave out a call on congratulating everybody on the important find, and Sherman, the cache operator, seconded his sentiments. We were sorry, of course, about the damaged aeroplane, but hoped it could be easily mended. Then, at 11 p.m., came another call from Lake. All right. Be safe. <clears throat> Though it was technically sleeping time, not one of us listeners... I've, I've read that. Sorry. Up with Carol over the fi highest foothills. Don't dare try to climb really tall peaks in present weather, but shall later. Frightful work climbing and a hard going at this altitude, but worth it. Great range, fairly solid. Hence, can't get any glimpses beyond. Main summits exceed Himalayas and very queer. Range looks like pre-Cambrian slate with plain, plain signs of many other upheaved strata. Was wrong about volcanism. Goes farther in either direction than we can see. Swept clear of snow above, above 21,000 feet. 
Odd formations on slopes of highest mountains. Great low square blocks with exactly vertical sides and rectangular lines of low vertical ramparts. Like the old Asian castles clinging to steep mountains and roar arch paintings. Impressive from distance. Flew close to some, and Carol thought they formed smaller separate pieces, but that is probably weathering. Most edges crumbled and rounded off as if exposed to storms and climate change for millions of years. Parts, especially upper parts, seem to be of lighter colored rock than any visible strata on slopes proper, hence of evidently crystalline origin. Close flying shows many cave mouths, some unusually regular in outline, square, or semicircular. You must come and investigate. Think I saw ramparts squarely on top of one peak. Height seems about 30,000 to 35,000 feet. Am up 21,500 myself in devilish gnawing cold. Wind whistles and pipes through passes and in and out of caves. But no flying danger so far. From then on, for another half hour, Lake kept up a running fire of comment and, I, and expressed his intention of climbing some of the peaks on foot. I replied that I would join him as soon as he could send a plane and that Pabodi and I would work out the best gasoline plan just where and how to concentrate our supply in view of the expedition's altered character. Obviously, Lake's boring operations, as well as his aeroplane activities, would require a great deal for the new base which he planned to establish at the foot of the mountains. And it was possible that the eastward flight might not be made after all this season. In connection with this business, I called Captain Douglas and asked him to get as much as possible out of the ships and up the barrier with a single dog team, the single dog team we had left there. A direct route across the unknown region between the lake and McMurdo Sound was what we really ought to establish. Lake called me later to say that he had decided to let the camp stay where Molten's plane had been forced down, and where repairs had already progressed somewhat. The ice sheet was very thin, with dark ground here and there visible, and he would sink some boring and blasts at that very point before making any sledge trips or climbing expeditions. He spoke of the ineffable majesty of the whole scene and of the queer state of his sensations at being at the lee of vast silent pinnacles whose ranks shot up like a wall reaching the sky at the world's rim atwood's theodolite observations had placed the height of the five tallest peaks at from thirty thousand to thirty four thousand feet the windswept nature of the terrain clearly disturbed lake for it argued that the occasional existence of prodigious gales violent beyond anything we had so far encountered his camp lay a little more than five miles from where the higher foothills rose abruptly. I could almost trace a note of subconscious alarm in his words, flashed across a glacial void of 700 miles as he urged that we all hasten with the matter and get the strange new region disposed of as soon as possible. He was about to rest now after a continuous day's work of almost unparalleled speed, strenuousness, and results. In the morning, I had three cornered wireless talk with lake and captain douglas at their widely separated bases it was agreed that one of lake's planes would come by to my base in pabodi the five men and myself as well as all the fuel that it could carry the rest of the fuel question depending on our decision about the easterly troop trip could wait for a few days since lake had enough for immediate camp heat and borings as eventually the old southern base would ought to be restocked, but if we postponed the easterly trip, we would not use it till next summer, and, meanwhile, Lake must send a plane to explore a direct route between his new mountains and McMurdo Sound. Pabodi and I prepared to close our base for a short or long period, as the case might be. If we wintered the Antarctic, we would probably fly straight from Lake's base to the Arkham without returning to this spot. Some of our conical tents had already been reinforced by blocks of hard snow, and now we decided to complete the job of making a permanent village. Owing to a very liberal tent supply, Lake had with him all his base would ever need, even after our arrival. I wirelessly I wirelessed that Pabodi and I would be ready for northwestward move after one day's work and one night's rest. Our labors, however, were not steady after 4 p.m., for about that time, Lake began sending in the most extraordinary and excited messages. His working day had started unproported from... Yeah, pro Propitiously, I... There's some words in here that I just... There's a lot. Since an airplane survey of the nearly exposed rock surface showed entire absence of those arcane and primordial strata for which he was looking, and which formed so great a part of the colossal peaks that loomed up 
at a tantalizing distance from the camp. Most of the rocks glimpsed were apparently Jurassic and uh, Comanchean sandstones and Permian and Triassic schists, and ne with now then a glossy black outcropping suggesting a hard and salty coal. Lake, whose plan all, plans all hinged on unearthing specimens more than 500 million years, or who is a... Uh, uh, what, yeah, what are words even? That's, that's a question I have all the time. <laughs> okay. Ba, 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 ba. Wait, I already for, <laughs> I left off now. Oh, no. Okay. He had resolved, nevertheless, to do some local boring as a part of the expedition's general program. Hence, he set up the drill and put five men to work with it while the rest finished settling camp and repairing the damaged aeroplane. The softest visible rock, a sandstone about a quarter of a mile from the camp, had been chosen for the first sampling, and the drill made excellent progress without much supplementary blasting. It was about three hours afterward, following the first really heavy blast of the operation, that the shouting of the drill crew was heard. And the young Gedney, the acting foreman, rushed into the camp with the startling news. They had struck a cave. Early in the boring, the sandstone had given place to a vein of Comanchean limestone full of minute fossil cephalopods, corals, echini, and spirifera. And with the occasional suggestions of siliceous sponges and marine vertebrae bones, the latter probably of telos sharks and ganoids. This, in itself, was important enough, I guess, if I knew more about fossils, as affording the first vertebrae fossils the expedition had yet secured, but when shortly afterward the drill had dropped through the stratum into the apparent vacancy, a wholly new and doubly intense wave of excitement spread among the excavators. A good-sized blast laid open the subterranean secret, N and now, through a jagged aperture perhaps five feet across and three feet thick, there yawned before the avid searchers a section of shallow limestone hollowing worn by more than 50 million years ago by the trickling groundwaters of a bygone tropic world. The hollowed layer was not more than seven or eight feet deep, but extended off indefinitely in all directions and had a fresh, slightly moving air which suggested its membership in an extensive subterranean system. Its roof and floor were abundantly equipped with large stalactites and stalagmites, some of which met in columnar form, but important above all else was the vast deposits of shells and bones, in which places nearly choked the passage. Washed down from unknown jungles of Mesozoic tree ferns and fungi, the forests of tertiary cycads, fan and palms, and primitive angiosperms, this osseous medley contained representatives of more Cretaceous, Eocene, and other animal species than the greatest paleontologist could have counted or classified in a year. Oh. Oh, oh. Mollusks, crustacean armor, fishes, amphibians, reptile, birds, and early mammals, great and small, known and unknown. No wonder Gedney ran back to the camp shouting, and no wonder everyone else dropped work and rushed headlong through the biting cold to where the tall Derek marked a newfound gateway to the secrets of inner earth and vanished aeons. You know, if I happened upon a cavern that was full of, like, dead things, even if I was, like, a paleontologist, I'd probably be like, hmm, this seems a little suspect. Oh, jeez. I, I don't like the thought of that, Otter, at all, actually. <laughs> When Lake had satisfied the first keen edge of his curiosity, he scribbled a message in his notebook and had young Moulton run back to the camp and dispatch it by wireless. This was my first word of the discovery, and it told of the identification of early shells, bones of ganoids and placoderms, remnants of the labyrinthodonts and the thecodonts, the great mosasaur skull fragments, dinosaur vertebrae and armor plates, pterodactyl teeth and wing bones, Aero, <laughs> Aero, Aeropatrix debris, Miocene shark's teeth, primitive bird skulls, and other bones of archaic mammals such as Paleotheres, Xiphodons, Eohippi, Oreodons, and Titanotheres. 
He could have just said it was full of a bunch of bones, but he had to name off like 50,000 kinds of bones. Oh, there's more. There was nothing as recent as a mastodon, elephant, true camel. What is a true camel? Are, are all other camels fake? Deer or bovine animal. Hence, Lake concluded that the last deposits had occurred during the Oligocene age and the hollowed stratum had lain in its present dried, dead, and inaccessible state for at least 30 million years. Cool. On the other hand, the prevalence of very early life forms was singular in even the highest degree. Though the limestone formation was, on the evidence of such typical embedded fossils as ventriculites, positively and unmistakably Comanchean and not a particular earlier and not a particle earlier for free fragments in the hollow space included a surprising proportion from organisms hitherto considered as peculiar to far older periods. Even rudimentary fish, mollusks, and corals as remote as the Silurian or Ordovici Ordovician. Thank you. Man, see, this is why I can't be like a writer. Do we have to research all this? Because this is a lot. This is a lot of words to know. And this is just... This has just all been in, like, two paragraphs. This is a lot. The inevitable inference was that this part of the world, there had been a remarkable and unique degree of continuity between the life over 300 million years ago and that of only 30 million years ago. How far this continuity had extended beyond the Oligocene age when the cavern was closed was, of course, past all speculation. In any event, the coming of the frightful ice in the... Pleistocene and some 500,000 years ago. A mere yesterday, as compared with the age of this cavity, must have put an end to any of the primal forms which had locally managed to outlive their common terms. Lake was not content to let his first message stand, but had another bulletin written and dispatched across the snow to the camp before Moulton could get back. After Moulton stayed at the wireless in one of the planes, transmitting to me and the Arkham for relaying to the outside world, the frequent postscripts which Lake sent him by a succession of messengers, those who follow the newspapers will remember the excitement created among the men of science by that afternoon's reports, reports which have finally led, after all these years, to the organization of that very Starkweather Moore expedition, which I am so anxious to dissuade from its purposes. I had better give this message literally as Lake sent them, as our base operator, McTie, translated them from pencil shorthand. Fowler makes discovery of highest importance in soundstone and limestone fragments from blasts. Several distinct triangular striated prints, like those in Archaean Slate, proving that the source survived from over 600 million years ago to the Comanchean times without more than moderate morphological changes and decrease in average size. Comanchean prints apparently more primitive, or decadent if anything, than older ones. Emphasize importance of discovery in press will mean to biology what Einstein has meant to mathematics and physics, joins up with my previous work and amplifies conclusions, appears to indicate, as I suspected, that Earth has seen a whole cycle or cycles of organic life before known ones that begin with the echozoic cells, was evolved and specialized not later than a thousand million years ago, when planet was young and recently uninhabitable for any life forms or normal protoplasmic structure, Question arises when, where, and how developments took place. Later, examining certain skeletal fragments of large land and marine saurians and primi primitive mammals, find singular local wounds or injuries to bony structures not attributable to any known predatory or carnivorous animal of any period. Of two sorts, straight penetrant bores and apparently hacking incisions. One or two cases of cleanly severed bones, not many specimens affected. I'm sending to camp for electric torches. We'll extend search for area underground by hacking away stalactites. Still later, have found peculiar soapstone fragments about six inches across and, and an inch and a half thick, wholly unlike any visible local for formation. Greenish, but no evidence to place its period. Has curious smoothness and regularity, shaped like five-pointed star with tips broken off, and signs of other cleavage, eh at inward angles and in center of surface. Small, smooth depression in center of unbroken surface. Arouses much curiosity as to source and weathering. 
Probably some freak of water action. Carol, with magnifier, thinks he can make out additional markings of geological significance. Groups of tiny dots in regular patterns. Dogs growing uneasy as we work. Seem to hate this soapstone. Must see if it has any peculiar odor. We'll report again when Mills gets back with light and we start an, an underground area. 10.15 p.m. Important discovery. Orendorf and Watkins, working underground at 9.45 with light, found monstrous barrel-shaped fossils of wholly unknown nature. Probably vegetable unless overgrown specimen, specimen of unknown marine radiata. Tissue evidently preserved by mineral salts. Tough as leather, but astonishingly flexibility retained in places. Marks of broken off parts at ends and around sides. Six feet end to end. Three and five tenths feet central diameter. Tapering to one foot each end. Like a barrel with five bulging ridges in place of staves. Lateral breakage, as of thinnish stalks, are at the equator in middle of these ridges. In furrows between ridges are curious growths. Combs or wings that fold up and spread out like fans, all greatly damaged but one, which gives an almost seven-foot wing spread. Arrangement reminds one of certain monsters of primal myth, especially fabled Elder Things and Necronomicon. Yeah, isn't that the point where you just, like, leave? Where you're like, hey, this seems like a, a whole lot like the terrible things I found in this book about terrible things and end of times. Maybe you shouldn't touch them. <sighs> Their wings seem to be membranous, stretched on framework of glandular tubing. Ew, glandular. Apparent minute orifices in frame tubing at wingtips. End of body shriveled, giving no clue to interior or what has been broken off there. Must dissect when we get back to camp. Can't decide whether vegetable or animal. Many features obviously of almost incredible primitiveness. Have set all hands cutting stalactites and looking for further specimens. Additional scarred bones found, but these must wait. Having trouble with dogs. They can't endure the new specimen and would probably tear it to pieces if we didn't keep it at a distance from them. And why don't you just leave it? Dogs know things! 11.30 p.m. Attention, Dryer, Pabody, Douglas. Matter of highest, I must say, transcendent importance. Arkham must relay to Kingsport Head Station at once. Strange barrel growth is the Archean thing that left prints in rocks. Mills, Bordreau, and Fowler discover a cluster of 13 more at underground point 40 feet from the aperture. Mixed with curiously rounded and configured soapstone fragments smaller than one previously found. Star-shaped, but no marks of breakage except at some of the points. Of organic specimens, eight apparently perfect, with all appendages, have brought all to surface, leading off dogs to distance. They cannot stand the thing. Give close attention to description and repeat back for accuracy. Papers must get this right. Oh boy. Objects are eight feet long all over. Six foot, five rigid barrel torso, three and five tenths feet central diameter. One foot and diameters. Dark gray, flexible, infinitely tough. Seven foot membrous wings of same color, found folded, spread out of furrows between ridges. Wing framework tubular or glandular, of lighter gray, with orifices at wingtips. We just said that. Spread wings have serrated edges. Around equator, at one central apex of the five vertical stave-like ridges are five systems of light, gray flexible arms or tentacles found tightly folded to torso, but expansible to maximum length of over three feet. Like arms of primitive crinoid. Single stalks three inches in diameter branch at, into six inches into five substocks, of which branches after eight inches into small, tapering tentacles or tendrils, giving each stock a total of 25 tentacles. I saw a lot of tentacles. At the top of torso, blunt, bulbous neck of lighter gray with gill-like suggestions holds yellowish, five-pointed, starfish-shaped apparent head covered with three-inch wiry cilia of various prismatic colors. Head thick and puffy, about two feet to a point, with three-inch flexible yellowish tubes projecting from each point. Slit in exact center of top, probably, breathing aperture. At, each end of each at the end of each tube is a spherical expansion where yellowish membrane rolls back on handle to reveal glassy, red iris globe, evidently an eye. Five slightly long, 
Longer reddish tubes start from an inner angles of starfish-shaped head and end in sac-like swellings of the same color, which, upon pressure, open to bell-shaped orifices two inches maximum diameter and lined with sharp, white tooth-like projections. Probably mouths. All these tubes, cilia, and points of starfish head found folded tightly down, tubes and points clinging to bulbous neck and torso. Flexibility surprising despite vast toughness. At bottom of torso, rough but dissimilarly functioning counterparts of head arrangements exist. Bulbous, light gray pseudoneck without gill suggestions holds greenish five-pointed starfish arrangement. Tough muscular arms about four feet long, tapering from seven inches diameter at base to about two and five tenths point. Each point is attached to an end of, of a greenish five-veined membranous triangle eight inches long and six wide. Am I going to have a test at the end of this? Because this is... I don't... They're like starfish creatures. They've got wings, and they've got a barrel body, and they have teeth. Oh, God. This is the paddle fin or pseudo foot, which has made prints and rocks from a thousand million to 50 or 60 million years old. Oh, wait, there's still a page and a half of description. From inner angles of starfish arrangement to project two foot reddish tubes tapering from three inch diameter at base at one tip. Orifices at tips. All these parts infinitely tough and leathery, but extremely flexible. Four foot arms with paddles undoubtedly used for locomotion of some sort, marine or otherwise. When moved, display suggestions of exaggerated muscularity. As found, all these projections tightly folded over pseudo neck and end of torso, corresponding to projections at other end. Cannot yet assign positively to animal or vegetable kingdom. Odds now favor animal. Probably represents incredibly advanced evolution of radiata without loss of certain primitive features. Echinoderm resemblance is unmistakable despite local contradictory eff evidences. Wing structures puzzle wing structure puzzles in view of probable marine habitat, but may have you have used water in navigation. Symmetry is curiously vegetable-like, suggesting vegetables essential up and down structure rather than the animal's fore and aft structure. Fabulously early date of evolution, preceding even simplest Archean protozoa hitherto known, baffles all conjecture as to origin. Complete specimens have such uncanny resemblance to certain creatures of primal myth that suggestions of ancient existence outside of Antarctic becomes inevitable. Dyer and Pabodi have read the Necronomicon and seen Clark Ashton Smith's nightmare paintings based on text, and will understand when I speak of elder things supposed to have created all earth life as jest or mistake. Students have always thought conception formed from morbid imaginative treatment of very ancient topical radiata. Also, the prehistoric folklore things Wilmarth has spoken of, Cthulhu cult appendages, etc. Vast field of study opened. Deposits probably of late Cretaceous or early Eocene period, judging from the associated specimens. Massive stalagmites deposited above them. Hard work hewing out, but toughness prevented damage. State of preservation miraculous, evidently owing to limestone action. No more found so far, but resume search later. Job now to get 14 huge specimens to camp without dogs, which bark furiously and can't be trusted near them. With nine men, three left to guard the dogs, we ought to manage with three sledges fairly well. Though the wind is bad, must establish plane communication with McMurdo Sound before begin shipping material. But I've got to dissect one of these things before we take any rest. Wish I had a real laboratory here. Dyer better kick himself for having tried to stop my westward trip. First the world's greatest mountains, and then this. If this, l this last isn't the high spot in the expedition, I don't know what is. We've made scient- we're made scientifically. Congrats, Pabodi, on the drill that opened up the cave. Now will Arkham please repeat description? Okay, that was like five pages of him just talking about suckers and starfish and things. Whew. The sensation Pabodi and myself at receipt of the report are almost beyond description, nor were our companions much behind us in enthusiasm. McTai, who had hastily translated a few high spots as they came from the droning receiving set, wrote out the entire message from his shorthand version as soon as Lake's operator signed off. All appreciated the epoch-making significance of the discovery, and I sent Lake 
Congratulations, as soon as the Arkham's operator had repeated back the descriptive parts as requested. And my example was followed by Sherman from his station at McMurdo Sound Supply Cache, as well as Captain Douglas of the Arkham. Later, as head of the expedition, I added some remarks to be relayed through the Arkham to the outside world. Of course, the rest was an absurd thought amidst the excitement. My only wish was to get to Lake's camp as quickly as I could. It disappointed me when he sent word that a rising mountain gale made early aerial travel impossible. But within an hour and a half, interest again rose to banish disappointment. Lake, sent, sending more messages, told me of the completely successful transportation of the 14 great specimens to the camp. It had been a hard pull, for the things were surprisingly heavy, but nine men had accomplished it very neatly. Now some of the party were hurriedly building a snow corral at a safe distance from the camp, to which the dogs could be brought for greater convenience and feeding. The specimens were laid out on the hard snow near the camp, save for one on which Lake was making crude attempts at dissection. This dissection seemed to be a greater task than I had expected, for despite the heat of a gasoline stove and the newly raised laboratory tent, the deceptively flexible tissues of the chosen specimen, a powerful and intact one, lost nothing of their more than leathery toughness. Lake was puzzled as to how he might make the requisite incisions without violence destructive enough to upset all the structural niceties he was looking for. He had, it is true, seven more perfect specimens, but these were too few to use up recklessly unless the cave might later yield an unlimited supply. Accordingly, he removed the specimen and dragged in one which, though having remnants of the starfish arrangements at both ends, was badly crushed and partly disrupted along one of the great tor torso furrows. Results, quickly reported over the wireless, were baffling and provocative indeed. He really likes to use the word provocative. Nothing like delicacy or accuracy that was possible with instruments hardly able to cut the anomalous tissue, but the little that was achieved left us all awed and bewildered. Existing biology would have, would have to be wholly revised, for this thing was no product of any cell growth science knows about. There had, scarcely, there had been scarcely any mineral replacement, and despite an age of perhaps 40 million years, the internal organs were wholly intact. The leathery, alter, under-deteriorative, and almost indestructible quality was an inherent attribute of the thing's form of organization and pertained to some paleo paleogean cycle of invertebrate evolution be utterly beyond our powers of speculation. At first, all that lake found was dry, but as the heat heated tent provided its, or pro produced its thawing effect, organic moisture of pungent and offensive odor was encountered towards the thing's uninjured side. It was not blood, but it was a thick, dark green fluid, apparently answering the same purpose. By the time Lake had reached this stage, all 37 dogs had been brought to the still uncompleted corral near the camp, and even at that distance set up a savage barking to show and show of restlessness at the acrid, diffusive smell. Far from helping the place, uh, place the strange entity, this provisional dissection merely deepened its mystery. All guesses about its external members had been correct. And on the evidence that of these ones could hardly hesitate to call this thing an animal, but internal inspection brought up so many vegetable evidences that Lake was hopelessly left at sea. It had digestion and circulation, and eliminated waste matter through the reddish tubes of its starfish base. Curiously, one would say that its respiratory apparatus handled oxygen rather than carbon dioxide, and there were odd evidences of air storage chambers and methods of shifting respiration from the external orifice to at least two fully developed breathing systems, gills and pores. Clearly, it was amphibian and probably adapted to long airless hibernation periods as well. Vocal organs seemed present in connection to the main respiratory system, but they presented anomalies beyond immediate solution. Articulate speech and the sense of syllable utterance seemed barely conceivable, but musical piping notes covering a wide range were highly probable. The muscular system was almost prematurely developed. The nervous system was so complex and highly developed as to leave Lake aghast. Though excessively primitive and, ar and archaic in some respects, the thing had set a, had a set of ganglial centers and connective, connectives arguing the very extremes of specialized development. I, okay, fine, I'll, I'll hydrate.
Oh, geez. I sorry, I didn't realize that you had redeemed hydrate like six times. Thank you, foe. Also, if you want to play Resident Evil 4, you should. Then you can see more of Leon and do more kicks and stuff. <clears throat> ba -ba boom. <clears throat> okay, I gotta remember where I just was. <laughs> wow, well, it's okay. Sometimes that's what happens in games. You get killed. But it's fine. Then you learn from it, and you kill them right back with guts. Okay. Oh. Okay, I did the music piping. The mu muscular system was almost prematurely developed. The nervous system was so complex and highly developed as to leave Lake aghast. Though excessively primitive and archaic in some respects, the thing had a set of ganglial centers and connectives arguing the very extremes of specialized developments. Its five-lobed brain was surprisingly advanced, and there were signs of sensory equipment, served in part through the wiry cilia of the head, involving factors alien to any other terrestrial organism. Probably it has more than five senses, so that its habits could, be, could not be predicted from any existing analogy. It must, Lake thought, have been a creature of keen sensitiveness and delicate differentiated functions in the primal world, much like ants and bees of today. It reproduced like the vegetable cryptogams, especially the pteridophyta, having spores cases at the tips of the wings and evidently developing from a thallus or prothallus. What does that mean? I don't know. But to give it a name at this stage was mere folly. It looked like a radiata or a radiate, but it was clearly or something more. It was partly vegetable, but had three-fourths of the essential, uh, essentials of animal structure. It was that, it was marine in origin, its symmetrical contour and certain other attributes clearly indicated, yet one could not be exact as to the limit of its later adaptations. The wings, after all, held a persistent suggestion of the aerial. How it could have undergone its tremendously complex evolution on a newborn Earth in time to leave prints in the Archean rocks was so far beyond conception as to make Lake whimsically recall primal myths about great old ones who filtered down from the stars and concocted Earth life as a joke or mistake. And in the wild tales of cosmic hills from things outside told by a folklorist colleague in Miskatonic's English department. Naturally, he considered the possibility of the Precambrian prince having been made by a, a less evolved ancestor of the present specimens but quickly rejected that this too facile theory upon considering the advanced structures, structural quali qualities of the older fossils. If anything, the later contour showed decadence rather than the higher evolution. The size of the pseudo feet had decreased, and the whole morphology seemed uh, coarsened and simplified. Moreover, the nerves and organs just examined held a singular suggestion of retrogression from forms still more complex. Atrophied and vestigial parts were surprisingly prevalent. Altogether, little could be said to have been solved, and Lake fell back on mythology for a provisional name, jocosely dub dubbing his finds the Elder Ones. Uh, that's, that seems like a terrible idea. At about 2.30 a.m., having decided to postpone further work and get a little rest, he covered the dissected organism with a tarpaulin, emerged from the laboratory tent, and studied the intact specimens with, their, with renewed interest. The ceaseless Antarctic sun had begun to limber up their tissues a trifle, so that the head points and tubes of two or three showed signs of unfolding. But Lake did not believe that there was any danger of immediate decomposition in the almost sub-zero air. He did, however, move all of the undissected specimens close together and throw a spare tent over them in order to keep off direct solar rays. That would also help to keep their possible scent away from the dogs, whose hostile unrest was really becoming a problem even at their substantial distance behind the higher and higher snow walls, which an increased quota of the men were hastened to raise around their quarters. He had to weigh down the corners of their tent cloth with heavy blocks of snow to hold it in place amidst a rising gale, 
for the Titan Mountain seemed to be about to deliver some gravely severe blasts. Earlier apprehensions about sudden Antarctic winds were revived, and under Atwood's supervision, precautions were taken to bank th with the tents. New uh, bank the tents, new dog corral, and crude aeroplane shelters with snow on the mountainward side. These latter shelters, begun with hard snow blocks during odd moments, were by no means as high as they should have been, and Lake finally detached all hands from other tasks to work on them. It was at after four when Lake had prepared to sign off and invite us all to share the rest period his outfit would take when the shelter walls were a little higher. He held some friendly chat with Pabodi over the ether, repeated his praise of the really marvelous drills that had helped him make his discovery. Atwood also sent greetings and praises. I gave Lake a warm word of congratulation, owning up that he was right about the western trip, and that we all agreed to get in touch by wireless at ten in the morning. If the gale was then over, Lake would send a plane for the party at my base. Just before retiring, I dispatched a final message to the Arkham, with instructions about toning down the day's news for the outside world, since full details seemed radical enough to rouse a wave of incredulity until further substantiated. That's right. None of us, I imagine, slept very heavily or continuously that morning. Both the excitement of Lake's discovery and the mounting fury of the wind were against such a thing. So savage was the blast, even where we were, that we could not help wondering how much worse it was over at Lake's camp, directly under the vast unknown peaks that bred and delivered it. McTai was awake at 10 o'clock, and I tried to get Lake on the wireless, as agreed, but some electrical condition were... In the disturbed air to get the westward seemed to prevent communication. We did, however, get the Arkham, and Douglas told me that he likewise been vainly trying to reach Lake. He had not known about the wind, for very little was blowing at McMurdo Sound, despite its persistent rage where we were. Throughout the day, we all listened anxiously and tried to get Lake at intervals, but invariably without results. About noon, a positive frenzy of wind stampeded out the west, causing us to fear for the safety of our camp, but eventually it died down with only a moderate relapse at 2 p.m. After 3 o'clock, it was very quiet, and we redoubled our efforts to get Lake. Reflecting that he had four planes, each provided with an excellent shortwave outfit, we could not imagine any ordinary accident capable of crippling all his wireless equipment at once. Nevertheless, the stony silence continued, and when we thought of delirious forces wind must have had in his locality, we could not help but make the most direful conjectures. By six o'clock, our fears had become deaf, intense and definite. And after a wireless consultation with Douglas and Thor Finson, I resolved to take steps towards investigation. The fifth aeroplane, which we had left at the McMurdo Sound Supply Cache with Sherman and two sailors, was in good shape and ready for instant use, and it seemed that the very emergency for which it had been saved was now upon us. I got Sherman by wireless and ordered him to join me with the plane, and the two sailors at the southern base as quickly as possible, with the air conditions being apparently highly favorable. We then talked over the personnel of the coming investigation party, and decided we would include all hands together with sledge and dogs which I had kept with me. Even so great a load would not be too much for one of the huge planes built to our special orders for heavy machinery transportation. At intervals I still tried to reach Lake with the wireless, but to no purpose. Sherman, with the sailors in Gunnarsson and Larson, took off at 7.30 and reported a quiet flight from several points on the wing. They arrived at our base at midnight, and all hands at once discussed the next move. It was risky business sailing over the Antarctic in a single aeroplane, without any line of bases, but no one drew back from what seemed like the plainest necessity. We turned in at 2 o'clock for a brief rest after some preliminary loading of the plane. But we're back up again in four hours to finish the loading and packaging. At 7.15 a.m., January 25th, we started flying northwestward under McTie's pilotage with ten men, seven dogs, a sledge, a fuel and food supply, and other items including the plane's wireless outfit. The atmosphere was clear, fairly quiet, and relatively mild in temperature, and we anticipated very little trouble in reaching the latitude and longitude designated by Lake as at the site of his camp. Our apprehensions were over what we might find, or fail to find, at the end of our journey, for silence continued to answer all calls dispatched to the camp. 
Every incident of that four and a half hour flight is burned into my recollection because of its crucial position in my life. It marked my loss at the age of 54 of all that peace and balance which the normal mind possesses through its accustomed conception of external nature and nature's laws. Thenceforward, the ten of us, but the student Danforth and myself above all others, were to face a hideously amplified world of lurking horrors which nothing can erase from our emotions, and which we would refrain from sharing with mankind in general if we could. The newspapers have printed the bulletins we sent from the moving plane, telling of our non-stop course, our two battles with treacherous upper-air gales, our glimpse of the broken surface where Lake had sunk his mid-journey shaft three days before, and our sight of a group of those strange, fluffy snow cylinders noted by Amundsen and Bird rolling in the wind across the endless league of frozen plateau. There came a point, though, when our sensations could not be conveyed into any words the press would understand, and a latter point when we had to adopt an actual rule of strict censorship. The sailor Larson was first to spy the jagged line of witch-like cones and pinnacles ahead, and his shout sent everyone to the windows of the great cabined plane. Despite our speed, they were very slow in gaining prominence, hence we knew that they must be infinitely far off, invisible only because of their abnormal height. Little by little, however, they rose grimly into the western sky, allowing us to distinguish various bare, bleak, blackish summits, and to catch a curious sense of fantasy which they inspired as seen in the reddish Antarctic light against the provocative background of iridescent ice dust clouds. In the whole spectacle, there was a persistent, pervasive hint of stupendous secrecy and potential revelation. It was as if these stark, nightmare spires marked the pylons of a frightful gateway into forbidden spheres of dream, and complex gulfs of remote time, space, and ultra-dimensionality. I could not help feeling that they were evil things. Yeah, a lot of red flags, exactly. Like, hey, you lost contact with people after they dug up these things that they keep on jokingly referring to as old, ancient ones, and now there are these weird snow spires all over the place. I don't, I don't have a good feeling about this. I mean, granted, it is Lovecraft, so I probably shouldn't have a good feeling, but... Somebody... <laughs> Ah, oh, that's not true, foe. Okay. Uh, bu -bu. I could not help feeling that they were evil. Th that they were evil things. Oh well, at least he kind of understands, but he still keeps flying that way. Mountains of madness through farther slopes. Uh, looked out over some accursed abyss. This that seething, half luminous cloud background held ineffable suggestions of a vague ethereal beyondness far more than terrestrial sp spatial and gave appalling reminders of the utter remoteness separateness desolation and aeon-long death of this untrodden and unfathomed astral world it was young danforth who drew our notice to the curious regularities of the higher mountain skyline regularities like clinging fragments of perfect cubes of which lake had mentioned in his messages and which indeed justified his comparison with the dreamlike suggestion of primordial temple ruins on cloudy Asian mountaintops so suddenly and strangely painted by Rorish. There was indeed something hauntingly Rorish-like about this whole unearthly continent of mountainous mystery. I had felt it in October when I first caught sight of Victoria Land, and I felt afresh now. I, f I felt, too, another wave of uneasy consciousness of archaean mythical resemblances, of how disturbingly this lethal realm corresponded to the evilly famed plateau of Lang and its primal writings. Mythologists have placed Lang in Central Asia, but the racial memory of man, or his predecessors, is long, and it may well be that certain tales have come down from lands and mountains and temples of horror earlier than Asia and earlier than any human world we know. Few daring mystics have hinted at pre Pleistocene origin of the fragmentary Nicotic manuscripts and have suggested the devotees of Sothagua, elder god names, uh, were as alien to mankind as Sothagua itself. Lang, whenever in space or as time it might brood, was not a region I would care to be in or near. Nor did I relish the proximity of a world that had ever bred such ambiguous and archaean monstrosities as those Lake j had just mentioned. 
At the moment, I felt sorry that I had ever read the abhorred Necronomicon or talked so much with the unpleasantly erudite folklorist Wilmarth at the university. This mood undoubtedly served to aggravate my reaction to the bizarre mirage which burst upon us from the increasingly opulent zenith as we drew near the mountains and began to make out the cumulative undulations of the foothills. I had seen dozens of polar mirages during the preceding weeks, and some of them quite uncanny and fantastically vivid as the present samples, but this one had a wholly novel and obscure quality of, menacingly, of menacing symbolism, and I shuddered as the seething labyrinth of fabulous walls and towers and minarets loomed out of the troubled ice vapors above our heads. The effect was that of a cyclopean city with no architecture known to man or to human imagination, with vast aggregations of, black, of night black masonry embodying monstrous perversions of geometrical laws. There were truncated cones, sometimes terraced or fluted, surmounted by tall cylindrical shafts here and there, bulbously enlarged and often capped with tiers of thinnish scalloped discs, and strange beetlings, table-like constructions suggesting piles of multitudinous rectangular slabs, or circular plates, or five-pointed stars with each one overlapping one at beneath. There were composite cones and pyramids either along or surmounting cylinders or cubes or flatter truncated cones and pyramids. There's a bunch of shapes. <sighs> and occasionally needle-like spires and curious clusters of five. All these febrile structures seemed knit together by tubular bridges crossing from one to the other at various dizzy heights. And the implied scale of the whole terrifying and oppressive thing, uh, terrifying and oppressive in its sheer gigantism. The general type of mirage was not unlike some of the wilder forms observed and drawn by the Arctic whaler Scoresby in the 1820. But at this time and place, with those dark, unknown mountain peaks soaring stupendously ahead, that anomalous elder world discovery in our minds, and the pall of probable disaster enveloping the greater part of our expedition, we all seem to find it a taint of Latin malignity and infinitely evil portent. Yeah, but you're still going there. I was glad when the mirage began to break up, though the process from... In, uh, though in the process, the various nightmare turrets and cones assumed distorted, temporary forms of even vaster hideousness. As the whole illusion dissolved to churning opalescence, we began to look, earth look earthward again, and saw that our journey's end was not far off. The unknown mountains ahead rose dizzily up like fearsome rapids of giants. Their curious regularity showing with startling clearness, even without a field glass. We were over the lowest foothills now and could see amidst the snow, ice, and bare patches of their main plateau a couple of darkish spots with which we took to be Lake's camp and boring. The higher foothills shot up between five to six miles away, forming a range almost distinct from the terrifying line of more than Himalayan peaks beyond them. At length, Ropes, the student who had relieved McTie at the controls, began to head downward toward the left-hand dark spot whose size marked it as the camp. As he did so, McTie sent out the last uncensored wireless message the world was to receive from our expedition. I wonder if he said bad words. Everyone, of course, has read the brief and unsatisfying bulletins of the rest of our Antarctic sojourn. Some hours after our landing, we sent a guarded report of the tragedy we found and reluctantly announced the wiping out of the whole lake party by the frightful wind preceding day or the night before that. Eleven known dead, young Gedney missing. People pardoned our hazy lack of details and believed us when we explained that the mangling action of the wind had rendered all eleven bodies unsuitable for transportation outside. Indeed, I flatter myself that even amidst our distress, utter bewilderment, and soul-clutching horror, we scarcely went beyond the truth in any specific instance. The tremendous significance lies in what we dared not tell, what I would not tell now, but for need of warning others off nameless terrors. It is a fact that the wind had brought dreadful havoc. Whether all could have lived through it, even without the other thing, is gravely open to doubt. The storm, with its fury of madly driven ice particles, 
must have been beyond anything our expedition had encountered before. One aeroplane shelter, all it seems, had been left far too flimsy in an adequate state, was nearly pulverized. And the derrick at the distant boring was entirely shaken to pieces. The exposed metal of the grounded planes and drilling machinery was bruised into a high polish, and two of the small tents were flattened despite their snow bankings. Wooden surfaces left out in the blaster were pitted and denuded of paint. <gasps> denuded. And all signs of tracks in the snow were completely obliterated. It is also true that we found none of the archaean biological objects in a condition to take outside as a whole. We did gather some minerals from a vast, tumbled pile, including several of the greenish soapstone fragments, whose odd five-pointed roundings and faint patterns of grouped dots got so many doubtful comparisons, and some fossil bones, which among were the most typical of the curiously injured specimens. None of the dogs survived, their hurriedly built snow enclosure near the camp being almost wholly destroyed. Oh. The wind may have done that, though the greater breakage on the side of the camp, which was not the windward one, suggests an outward leap or break of the frantic beasts themselves. All three sledges were gone, and we have tried to explain that the wind might have blown them off into the unknown. The drill and the ice-melting machinery at the boring were too badly damaged to warrant salvage, so we used them to choke up that subtly disturbing gateway to the past which Lake had blasted. Since her surviving party had only four real pilots, Sherman, Danforth, McTie, and Ropes, and all, with Danforth in a poor, nervous shape to navigate. We brought back all the books, scientific equipment, and other incidentals we could find, though much was rather unaccountably blown away. Spare tents and furs were either missing or badly out of condition. It was approximately 4 p.m. after wide plane cruising had forced us to give Gedney up for lost that we did send our guarded message to the Arkham for relaying. And I think we did well to keep it as calm and noncommittal as we were succeeded in doing. The most we said about agitation concerned our dogs, whose frantic uneasiness near the biological specimens was to be expected from Poor Lake's accounts. We did not mention, I think, their display of the same uneasiness when sniffing around the queer greenish soapstones and certain other objects in the disordered region. Objects including scientific instruments, aeroplanes, and machinery, both at the camp and the boring, whose parts had been loosened, moved, or otherwise tampered with by winds that must have harbored a singular curiosity in investigativeness. Investigativeness. Um, about the 14 biological specimens, we were pardonably indefinite. We said that the only ones we discovered were damaged, but that enough was left of them to prove Lake's description wholly and impressively accurate. It was hard work keeping our personal emotions out of this matter, we did not mention the numbers or say exactly how we had found those which we did find. We had by the time we by that time agreed not to transmit anything suggesting madness on the part of Lake's men, and it surely looked like madness to find six imperfect monstrosities carefully buried upright in nine foot snow graves under five pointed mounds punched over with groups of dots in patterns exactly like those in the queer greenish soapstones we dug up from the Mesozoic or tertiary times. The eight perfect specimens mentioned by Lake seem to have been completely blown away. We were careful, too, about the public's general peace of mind, hence Danforth and I said little about the frightful trip over the mountains the next day. It was the fact that only a radically lightened plane could possibly cross a range of such height, which I mercifully limited that our scouting tour to two of us. On our return at 1 a.m., Danforth was close to hysterics, but kept admirably stiff upper lip. It took no persuasion to make him promise not to show our sketches and other things that we brought away in our pockets, not to say anything more than the others, to the others than what we had agreed to relay outside, and to hide our camera films for private development later on, so that part of my present story will be as new to Pabodi, McTai, Ropes, Sherman, and the rest as it will be to the world in general. Indeed, Danforth forth his closer mouth than I, for he saw, or thinks he saw, one thing he will not even tell me. As all know, our report included a tale of hard ascent, 
a confirmation of Lake's opinion and that the great peaks of the Archean Slate and other very primal crumpled strata unchanged since the middle Comanchean times, a conventional comment on the regularity of the clinging cube and rampart formations, a decision that the cave mouths indicate dissolved calcareous veins, a conjecture that certain slopes and passes would permit the scaling and crossing of the entire range by seasoned mountaineers, and a remark that the mysterious other side holds a lofty and Im immense super plateau. As ancient and unchanging as the mountains themselves, 20,000 feet in elevation, with grotesque rock formations protruding through a thin glacial layer and with a low gradual foothills between the general plateau surface and the sheer precipices of the higher peaks. Or highest peaks. This body of data is in every respect true so far as it goes, and it completely satisfied the men of the camp. We laid our absence of 16 hours, a longer time than our announced flying, landing, uh, reconnoitering, and rock collecting program called for, to a long mythical spell of adverse wind conditions, and told truly of our landing on the farther foothills. Fortunately, our tale sounded realistic and prosaic enough not to tempt any of the others into emulating our flight. Had any tried to do that, I would have used every ounce of my persuasion to stop them, and I do not know what Danforth would have done. While we were gone, Pabody, Sherman, Ropes, McTie, and Williamson had worked like beavers over Lake's two best planes, fitting them again for use despite the altogether unaccountable juggling of their operative mechanism. We decided to load all the planes the next morning and start back for our old base as soon as possible. Even though indirect, that was the safest way to work toward McMurdo Sound, for a straight line flight across the most utterly unknown stretches of Aeon Dead Continent would involve many additional hazards. Further exploration was hardly feasible in our view of the tragic decimation and ruin of our drilling machinery. The doubts and horrors around us, which we did not reveal, made us wish only to escape from this austral world of desolation and brooding madness as swiftly as we could. As the public knows, our return to the world was accomplished without further disasters. All planes reached the old base on the evening of the next day, January 27th, after a swift non-stop flight, and on the 28th we made McMurdo sound in two laps, one with the one pause being very brief, and occasionally uh, occasioned by a faulty rudder in the furious wind over the ice shell after we had cleared the Great Plateau. In five days more, the Arkham and Miskatonic, uh, with all hands and equipment on board, were shaking clear of the thickening ice, field ice and working up Ross Sea with the mocking mountains of Victoria Land looming westward against a troubled Antarctic sky and twisting the wind's wails into a wide-ranged musical piping which chilled my soul to the quick. Less than a fortnight later, we left the last hint of polar land behind us and thanked heaven that we were clear of a haunted, accursed realm where life and death, space and time, have made black and blasphemous ally alliances in the unknown epochs since matter first writhed and swam on the planet's scarce cooled crust. Since our return, we have all constantly been working to discourage Antarctic exploration and have kept certain doubts and guesses to ourselves with splendid unity and faithfulness. Even young Danforth, with his nervous breakdown, has not flinched or babbled to his doctors. Indeed, as I have said, there is one thing he thinks he alone saw, which he will not tell me even though I think it would help his psycho psychological state if he would consent to do so. It might explain and relieve much, though perhaps the thing was no more than the delusive aftermath of an earlier shock. That is the impression I gather after those rare, irresponsible moments when he whispered disjointed things to me, things which he repudiates vehement vehemently as soon as he gets a grip on himself again. It will be hard work deterring others from the Great White South, and some of our efforts may directly harm our cause by drawing inquiring notice. We might have known that the first from the first human curiosity is undying, and that the results we announced would be enough to spur others ahead on the same age-long pursuit of the unknown. Lake's reports of those biological monstrosities had aroused naturalists and paleontologists to the highest pitch, though we were sensible enough not to show the detached parts we had taken from the actual buried specimens, or our photographs of those specimens as they were found. 
We also refrain from showing the more puzzling of the scarred bones and greenish soapstones, while Danforth and I have closely guarded the pictures we took or drew on the super plateau across the range, and the crumpled things we smoothed, studied, and teared, and brought away in our pockets. But now that Stark, Starkweather Moor party is organizing, with a thoroughness far beyond anything our outfit had attempted, if not dissuaded, they will get to the innermost nucleus of the Antarctic and melt and bore till they bring up that which, which we know may end the world. So I must break through all the reticences at last, even about that ultimate, nameless thing beyond the mountains of madness. Okay, that's where I'm going to stop reading for today, because that's like, that's like an hour and a half, 36 pages. And now we've learned that there's horrible things in the mountains, and they dug them up anyway because scientists, and of course bad things happen. But you know, that's just how science works, I think.